Um, so in this session, what we really want to explore is how speakers from diverse industries unpack the pandemic's challenges and what they have revealed what? to us about the capacity of entrepreneurial societies and possibly what they can achieve to overcome state and market failures during a crisis. Is Africa positioned to realize its full potential and what it what is the dawn of a new technological era? Um, this question asks these speakers to address opportunities and challenges in the wider context of entrepreneurship in Africa. Um, from various accessible trade and employment to business-centered education and technological innovation. But without talking too much, um, I will hand this over to our great moderator, Didi Akin Yuler, to introduce um, the session further, as well as the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Didi Akinyanure and it's an honor to be your moderator for this LSE Africa Summit panel themed uh, African Entrepreneurship Innovating Our Way Forward. As you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic caught the world completely by surprise and its huge global impact is likely to be felt for years to come. The pandemic has been hard on businesses all over the world. While many have failed, there have been businesses that have thrived in spite of the difficult operating environment. Many entrepreneurial businesses have pivoted to meet new needs for goods or services born out of the crisis. And innovation and digitization has been key to the success of business and entrepreneurship. So just as was mentioned at the very start, we are thrilled to be joined today by esteemed uh, speakers from diverse industries to uh, tackle the theme for the day. We are focusing on Africa. We're asking is Africa positioned to realize its full potential uh, in a new technological world? And we want to know wh where the opportunities are and uh, what are the challenges um, in the wider context of entrepreneurship in Africa. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming our panelists. I shall introduce them briefly. Professor Landry Singhe is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, distinguished fellow at Stanford University and professor and founding a senior director of the Fourth Industrial Revolution and Globalization 4.0 Center at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. Welcome, Professor. We also have Dr. Soli Makuliso. He's an international entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in the US, Switzerland, and Southern Africa. His current professional interests are in innovation and entrepreneurship for sustainable impact with a particular interest in health. He currently serves um, the deputy head of the Essential Tech Center at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Welcome, Dr. Solly. Jessica is acknowledged as an expert on the possibilities that the creative and cultural industries offer for Nigeria, Africa, and the global black diaspora. He's a leading advocate for Nigerian and African soft power and has been involved in promoting and enabling opportunities in the technology, sports, media, and entertainment industries in Nigeria and globally for over 20 years. And last but certainly not the least, we have Dr. Eleni Gabri Marine one of the founders of Ethiopia's Commodity Exchange and is currently the Chief Happiness Officer of Ethiopia's first youth agribusiness incubator, Blue Moon. She's well-versed in agricultural markets, commodity exchange, food policy and entrepreneurship. Welcome to you all. Now, this is a one hour, 15 minutes or so, maybe slightly less session. Uh, I hope to spend the last 15 minutes or so on questions and answers. I believe that you're able to drop your questions in the chat function. Uh, so do uh, keep this as interactive as, as possible and hopefully uh, viewers will be able to take some of your questions um, as soon as we can. All right, so let's get straight into it. And I do hope everyone's there. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, in a way, a generic question to get all your views because it is quite interesting that in spite of losses made in the pandemic uh, in some markets, um, there has been a surge in entrepreneurial activities and uh, creativity with entrepreneurs. Um, and entrepreneurs are finding new ways of, of doing business. So um, I, I guess I'll start with you, Professor Landry. I, I wanna get your assessment on the impact of the pandemic on entrepreneurship 
in Africa. Uh, and I'm asking as a continent, you know, as you know, we're very honorable people. So has the pandemic sucked out the drive and zeal in us? Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Didi, for this very kind uh, introduction. And I would also like to commend the organizers uh, of uh, this uh, incredibly important event. Uh, so, uh, Didi, this is my, 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 my perception and supported by evidence, by some surveys. Entrepreneurship men at uh, his uh, high in Africa. So if we compare Africa and, and perhaps even Sub-Saharan Africa with uh, the rest of the other regions, including Central Asia, Eastern and Central Europe, Latin America or South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa outperformed uh, those regions in terms of perceived opportunity of entrepreneurship, in terms of per se capability, although there, I think uh, the continent can still improve, there's still a skill gap, but that's the per se one. Uh, so close to Latin America in terms of fear of failure rate, so which means that in Africa, people are not um, concerned about potentially failing, uh, compared, for example, to South Asia, Middle East and North Africa, uh, 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 East and Southeast Asia, for example. In terms of entrepreneurial intention, Africans are more excited uh, to be entrepreneurs uh, uh, and ha they have the intention to become entrepreneurs in the short run uh, compared to other regions. The only other region which is comparable is the Middle East. But also in terms of uh, total yearly state entrepreneurial activity, so Africa outperform uh, other regions. And the status of entrepreneur also in Africa is very respectful. Uh, so those are some of the, the, the elements, uh, 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 addition to the fact that being an entrepreneur is also considered as uh, in an important career choice. Perhaps the area where Africa is outperformed by Asia and some of Latin America is perhaps the motivation. So some African may get more discouraged than than other but i just want to highlight those trends uh to show that there's no better time uh to be an entrepreneur in africa uh but now of course i can i will be happy later to further expand on the biggest trend uh which is which explain why uh entrepreneurship remain uh so important uh, respected despite the challenges that uh, our entrepreneurs uh, face on the continent. So I'll be happy to further expand on the opportunities uh, later. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, I mean it, it would be certainly great to you know hear those views from you. Uh, Dr. Solly, I'd like you to chip in here. And I mean, where my mind is going is I, I, I wonder if the reason entrepreneurship um, hasn't dwindled in, in Africa, is, is this because when you think about the fact that fundamental issues that were already in place before the pandemic, you know, they, they're still there. So, for example, while other entrepreneurs around the world um, may suddenly have been faced with a lack of access to funding because of the pandemic, but, you know, for us, this has always been a fundamental issue. Um, and these basic necessities have forced us to innovate. Uh, Dr. Solly, what's your view? You're on mute. I think, uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think um, on the continent, people, it's been a case of, uh, uh, anyway, swim or sink. So uh, I think people recognize the fact that you've got to try and make a better living out of, you know, for, for, for yourself rather than to expect uh, uh, the misery and gloom that we, we've always seen. So I think that spirit has always been there. And um, my take on, uh, 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 you know, uh, in terms of the, the, the pandemic and uh, its uh, potential consequences going forward. Um, I think it, it, it's something that is probably an observation that is uh, cross-cutting that we see all over the world, which is uh, uh, the fact uh, that a local manufacturing of essential good uh, is, has become more important than ever. Uh, so, uh, which means that uh, this is probably another hunting, a potential hunting ground for uh, uh, entrepreneurs to be, uh, you know, on the African continent. 
Uh, but on the other hand, me coming from a technology oriented, uh, uh, you know, type of products or, so, or innovation perspective, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, what does this mean in, within the context of Africa? In other words, what is the prospect of manufacturing, you know, essential technology based goods in, in Africa? Um, a quick answer, though, would have to be uh, that it, today it is, it is dismal, you know, but why? Uh, I mean, it, 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 the problem is that if you look at uh, numerous symbols such as medical equipment and devices, these devices that, that, that we see in Africa today, these devices are typically designed to meet uh, the needs of high income countries primarily. Uh, so markets such as Africa are typically the last item on the priority list of these manufacturers, which uh, uh, has two consequences. And the first one is that you will find that this, when these devices get there, they are ill-adapted for this context. They are not suitably designed for the climatic conditions that you may find there. And for some of the challenges that, that are reflected on the ground, lack of, uh, of personnel, you know, uh, appropriate budgets to follow up with maintenance, repairs and upgrades, uh, et cetera, and poor infrastructure. And also another issue is that because of the low priority of these markets, uh, it is unlikely that a multinational company will actually commit resources to build any uh, uh, local manufacturing facility in these regions. So um, uh, uh, while this is an opportunity that's there, uh, uh, we, 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 have, um, you know, we are still facing challenges on how we can grapple with it. And I'll comment later on though that uh, there, there might necessarily be a, a, a silver lining uh, on, on the horizon, but I, I'll probably leave that for uh, a, a, a comment um, uh, later on. All right, uh, Obi, let's bring you in and get your view on um, entrepreneurship, uh, African entrepreneurship uh, in the pandemic. Uh, you know, what's your assessment of the, of the situation? Uh, thanks a lot, Didi. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah? yeah? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. Yeah, just first of all, it's a great privilege to be here and to meet all my co-panelists. Um, the thing about it is I think that like um, Prof said, you know, the entrepreneurship culture on the continent is actually sort of perhaps what keeps the continent going. I mean, certainly in a place like Nigeria, where a lot of the business and private sector people will tell you that they, you can see we thrive or we do what we do in spite of government, not because of government. Now, um, one of the things that is very interesting that we've been seeing is that a lot of disruption. I mean, you know, younger people are talking about entrepreneurship as if it's new. Um, it's not new. When I was growing up, in Nigeria, they used to call it private practice, you know, so everybody had something else they were doing at their nine to five job. And I think that comes from a deep historical background. I mean, I'm, I happen to be Igbo. The Igbo have an ancient apprenticeship system which has been working in our markets and with our trade communities for, for a very long time. And that keeps going strong. What we haven't seen is perhaps scaling of some of these things to the modern environment, which is very, very, which is very, which is actually why I'm really interested in the panel because we have a technologist and we have a professor. And the two things you need to scale are to sort of investigate it at the academic level and then to translate it to profit, which is perhaps where Africa needs to get to now in 2021 and going beyond the pandemic. But in terms of the entrepreneurship culture and in terms of entrepreneurial behavior, um, I don't think anybody here has been waiting for government. So the fact that the pandemic happened, it's like, well, we deal with all these stresses anyway, so we just keep going. But we do have to actually give some credit to government as well, because for example, I mean, we're actually seeing vaccines here in Nigeria. I actually had my first shot last week, which is quite incredible. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm alive, which is great. You know, so, um, yeah. I mean, that th my view is that the culture is 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 ancient on the continent. That it, the practice happens, whether it's the Maghreb or in Sub-Saharan Africa. You see it in the markets. You see it in the people's culture, and that today is just a translation and continuation of that. And really, the the question for us is how how can we get indigenous capital behind our entrepreneurs? Because yes, foreign capital is coming, but we'll end up owning nothing. Right, and uh, Dr. Lenny, I'd like you to get your word in as well on this uh, first theme as well, in terms of you know the assessment of the environment, uh, entrepreneurship in Africa, uh, and uh, what the pandemic has meant for entrepreneurship in Africa. Okay. Okay, thank you, Didi. Uh, 
but just picking up from what uh, Professor Landry was talking about, um, sort of the, the spirit of entrepreneurship in, in Africa, I think it's important to note that there are going to be lots of variation within Africa. Um, I happen to be in Ethiopia, where I run uh, one of the top incubators in the country, uh, and in Ethiopia, we are in a, almost a, a, a quantum leap behind, I would say, uh, some of the, the, the front runners on the continent in terms of of entrepreneurship and if just looking at some of the statistics um you know uh, um, uh, number of businesses population i think kenya is a very high at 0.18 uh, ethiopia is, is at 0 0.02 so you know we've got a, a ways to, to go to catch up with some of our neighbors however that said um when the COVID um you know, a pandemic started, I uh, threw out a challenge to the startups in our uh, incubator and I said, okay, so here's a major global problem. Entrepreneurs are problem solvers. Find ways to add value. And it was quite incredible. And as uh, Soli was saying, you know, within 24 hours, um, the startups that were doing other things, you know, had sort of pivoted and dropped whatever else they were doing and got into mask manufacturing, hand sanitizer, delivery, all sorts of things around filling the gaps uh, with COVID. And I've been involved in a, in a UNDP project looking at, you know, the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Africa in general. And I was on a call around that time where, you know, UNDP was sort of saying, what are we going to do? They said, going to fall apart. And I said, listen, um, you know, I have around the country doing all these amazing things. And, and that sort of seemed to be what I think 2020 showed us and even showed the world that, um, that this was not just uh, you know a pandemic that affected and was very you know detrimental to African business, but also in some sense it was a COVID moment as an opportunity for innovation to to flourish. Uh, so I've been working a lot around what that innovation ecosystem looks. So if I may reflect on that for a second, you know I think what we have as an advantage um, is that we don't have legacy systems, so we don't we can very quickly adapt to new uh, ways of doing things, mobile banking, you know, a lot of advances in fintech, uh, even on e-commerce we're, we're waiting. Um, and so there's just a, a lot um, that is in terms of the potential. But for me now, looking at what are the challenges is really around how do you, you know, how do you, um, foster the ecosystem in such a way that there's a symbiotic relationship between talent, um, risk capital, uh, and, uh, and, and the you know the the sort of corporate and demand sync. So bringing all these you know things together uh, in this ecosystem is is something that I think we're not quite there yet. There are some front runners: Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, and a few other countries that are, are also rising: uh, Rwanda, uh, Senegal. Overall, I think right now you know, and I think COVID has actually shown you know this COVID moment has really prompted um, a lot of countries to get into uh, some serious work on startup proclamations you're seeing uh, you know Senegal kicked it off uh, earlier um, uh, with the startup act uh, Ethiopia is about to have startup act uh, Tunisia and so, so 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 you know around the continent um, we're now seeing countries sort of easier not only to start up but also to scale up uh, and so, anyway, I'll, I'll continue later, but I just wanted to introduce this, that there, you know, this idea ecosystems, I think, where we need to be thinking. Interesting. Uh, a few interesting points, filling the gaps with COVID. Uh, I like that. And also um, an opportunity for innovation to flourish. Uh, I think it's, it's quite clear that the African entrepreneurial landscape um, is changing uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, Professor, I'd like to get your thoughts. And I know Dr. Eleni gave us some examples, but um, what types of innovations are you seeing coming through? Definitely, uh, there are different points. To... Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I, I, I can. Yes. Excellent. Uh, so, no, definitely, there are many points to highlight uh, here. And those are driven to a certain extent by the pandemic. But I think it is beyond the pandemic. The challenges that we face on the continent are simply incredible. And the pandemic has highlighted the importance for example of creating more uh, uh, opportunities for example in the healthcare uh, uh, sector so at the beginning of, of the pandemic 
we soon realized that in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we have a shortage of uh, ventilators, uh, in terms of, of medical masks among other uh, uh, area. But let me bridge that and connect this with the broader trends that we see uh, on the continent. So, uh, so the, the trend that I want to highlight is the fact that by 2030, because when you speak about the pandemic, you are speaking about within a year, last year or the next few years, but many of the challenges that the continent uh, have been facing and many countries on the continent have been, face, been facing or many of the countries in the continent have been facing uh, are long-term challenges which will continue. So the, the, the biggest trends that I highlight in my book, Unlocking Africa Business Potential, so uh, among th those ones. So first, we have the fast open growth. So uh, by 2031, 1.7 billion uh, uh, people. And despite the fast population growth, and that's the second point we have, we had before the pandemic, a quite respectable growth of the middle class of household consumption, which has now been challenged uh, by the pandemic. They, we also had an increased consumer spending. As a matter of fact, when we combine the, um, and the consumer spending and the business spending, by 2030, we'll have about 6.7 uh, trillion US dollar, so of combined consumer and business spending. In the uh, consumer side, you will have areas such as food, beverage, housing, healthcare, uh, consumer goods, amount order. In the business side, you will have agri-industry, agriculture, manufacturing, construction, transport, amount order. Some of the largest area in which uh, it is important uh, uh, to invest because opportunities uh, uh, will also be uh, 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 critical there. When we combine that to the fourth point, the fast urbanization and the new opportunities which evolve from the urbanization, as a matter of fact, will move from about six to 17 cities of more than 5 million habitants uh, from 2015 to 2030, and from three to five cities of more than 10 million uh, habitants. So that is really important because when we speak about city, we speak also about the rise of services which connect me to the to my fifth point the industrialization especially when we speak what we call at the brookings institution industries without smokestack service rated industries ict rated industries when people speak about africa or african countries in general some will highlight will speak about the industrialization because they think about traditional manufacturing but if you look at the at what we call uh, uh, industry without smokestacks, ICT rated uh, uh, and service rated indus uh, industries, export in those industries have grown six times faster than in traditional manufacturing between 1998 and 2015. So those are some of the biggest trends. You, despite the challenges, we have the improving ease of doing business, even less uh, democratic countries understand the importance of doing business. The rise of the African continental free trade area, uh, 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 which is being accelerated with Wamkelemene. Of course, uh, the barrier to trade are not just the trade barrier. You have infrastructure, uh, amount order. We have skills, we have the capital, amount order. And before the pandemic, the incredible competition between established powers such as the United States, France, or the UK, and the rising one uh, such as China, uh, India, Brazil, Russia on the continent, which also uh, provide more uh, opportunities. So, so with those elements, when we combine those positive trends, and I'm, I'm landing here uh, with the critical importance of the diaspora the role played by the diaspora whether we speak in terms uh, of uh, building bridges being an ambassador for the continent investing ensuring technological transfer uh, remittances uh, amount order it is definitely an incredibly exciting time for africa but governments still have to act more effectively to bridge the gap between the policies which can even help 
uh, unlock firms level innovations. And in the meantime, entrepreneur should also be better trained because the, the, the reason of, or not just Africa has a, an incredibly high uh, um, intention and dynamism in terms of entrepreneurship, but the, the, the failure rate is also higher on the continent exactly because uh, entrepreneurs do not always have the skill. There's a skill gap. There's also a lack of system, as uh, Eleni has pointed, among others. So I will stop there. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dr. Sadi, I'd, I'd, li I'd like to bring you in here as well, because I know that you have a special um, interest in health. And because of the pandemic, um, we've seen interest in the health sector um, continue to grow. Um, the uh, WHO uh, found that the uh, COVID pandemic in Africa uh, had spread the development of um, more than 120 innovations in health technology. So I'd like you to tap into the opportunities in this space. And uh, is this something likely to continue even when the pandemic ends? Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to maybe yeah you know, pick up from also the last speaker and say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before I, I, I address your question specifically, I think well, we've been seeing, uh, uh, we've been hearing a lot about uh, the, the, this fashionable trend of the fourth industrial revolution, which, uh, as everyone, uh, uh, you know, it's basically predicated on things such as uh, Internet of Things, uh, IT, etc. And uh, uh, actually, when you take a close look at it, this is probably one of the areas where a lot of these entrepreneurs that we're talking about are well placed. If you look at what, how Africa is actually, you know, despite uh, the, the, the limited resources, how they've been taking a, a lead in even in areas such as fintech, we look at Impesa as being some of, uh, uh, for example, uh, as the as, you know as the shining armor in terms of uh, mobile banking, which is now finally in places where I live. You know, so. I, you know, I, I, and wherever I've actually visited, uh, you know, uh, you know, my colleagues and I uh, at Central Tech, we lie, we obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, vis we, that was prior to COVID, we, pay, we paid several visits to different regions in, in Africa, uh, and we like to visit some of these uh, incubators, this uh, innovation ecosystem, and, uh, and I, I haven't been to Ethiopia yet, uh, so I do intend to actually touch base with you, uh, Eleni, uh, on this eventually, but you could see it's amazing uh, uh, how inspiring, you know, from a point of view of ICT based, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, innovations that are coming out of the internet. So which probably places us in a good, you know, stead to try and innovate also uh, in the area of health. Now we are talking about digital health. Uh, uh, that's one of the trends that uh, that, that are going, and and uh, you know what what patient does digital health have for us? Uh, we know we have a shortage of skills. Uh, that's one of you know if you look in the area of healthcare, we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough specialists, but that's where digital health can 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 play a role because now we are beginning to see things such as machine learning, etc., which can allow uh, for specialists or or even telemedicine, uh, etc., which can allow for. Uh, using this infrastructure to actually uh, 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 share whatever expertise we have, wherever you find it. And you combine that with uh, some of the uh, uh, new trends, some of uh, the, the, the new tools that are coming out from data science, uh, we may be able to try and make a headway in certain areas of, 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 of health. So yes, uh, I, uh, uh, there is a, a big promise uh, for going forward in the area of health in Africa, and one of which includes I would, I would put digital health as one of the key areas that that, that look very promising, and uh, and and it, it's made even by you know the, the already uh, uh, high presence obviously of mobile phones even in the remotest regions of, of the continent today. Thanks so much. Uh, and I mean, you're, you know, you are absolutely right because, you know, we are seeing the numbers of deals in Africa, you know, continue to grow and, you know, African startups continue to be very attractive to international um, venture capital. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you know, we, we have seen a lot of you know, deals come through, uh, particularly in fintech. Um, and, you know, we're seeing some in clean energy as well. I'd, I'd like to get um, Dr. Rainey to, to tap in here and comment uh, on the surge in interest that uh, we are getting in, in Africa from investors uh, and in spite of the pandemic as well. 
Yeah, that's a, a very good point and uh, an absolutely amazing phenomenon. It didn't just start uh, with COVID. Um, I would say 2019 was, I believe, doubling uh, the amount of venture capital coming into the continent over 2018, 2020 uh, quadruple. Uh, so, you know, we're now in the 1.5 billion um, range. Uh, and so this has been a really a, a trend over the last few years. There's also been an incredible, um, you know, growth of incubators, accelerators, hubs, um, and then also networks within among countries with the hubs. Um, and so I think, you know, there has been, um, uh, you know, a, a realization uh, of this uh, entrepreneurial spirit and a young, energetic and well-educated population. I think we need to talk about that too, because, you know, I think the last 20 years of social uh, programs, um, you know, health and education um, in, in almost, you know, every African country, to this emergence of a very talented, youthful labor force. Um, in Ethiopia alone, we have about 200,000 uh, graduates from university every year, of which 70% are in STEM, making actually Ethiopia one of the largest pools of technical talent on the continent. Um, and so, the, you know, so these are all reasons why I think uh, the investors are interested, in addition to the fact that um, as countries are uh, rising economically, the market, consumer market, um, uh, it's not just 1.2 billion people, it's a, it's a, you know, a trillion plus uh, dollar market. And so I think all of these are reasons why the world is starting to turn its uh, attention to, to Africa. I think we've had some, uh, some you know, emerging successes, Paystack last uh, October, uh, getting uh, a pretty uh, you know, uh, big uh, deal uh, out of Nigeria uh, in fintech. Uh, we've had now a couple of unicorns. And you know, the thing is that the world, and, and particularly VCs, um, there's, it's, it's a lot of, about hype um, and stories. And so to start to see the unicorns emerging in Africa, to see uh, to Obi's area, you know, the, the emergence of this massive Nollywood uh, and just creatives in general opportunity uh, I think Africa Development Bank has now launched their fashionomics uh, initiative, which is, and uh, the um, Brexit Bank is doing the $500 million creatives uh, fund. So there's just a lot of recognition that the market opportunity is large, uh, the talent pool is large, it's increasingly uh, better quality, um, and all of this underlaid by an, a sort of, I would say, an innate um, entrepreneurial spirit. And so, uh, yeah, I just think we're actually very much at the beginning, at the cusp of what Africa is going to be showing the world in terms of yeah. innovation. I mean, you know, clearly, as um, Dr. Nini said, you know, there's, you know, there's the need and um, the opportunities are there, but at, at, at the same time, it, it, it's, it's hard enough you know, to survive as an entrepreneur anywhere in the world, but, you know, as, as an African entrepreneur, it, it's, it's a pretty different thing. It's, you know, super tough. Um, and when you think about the challenges that are on the, on the continent face, you know, from access to funding, um, you know, barriers to, uh, to accessible trade and employment, or lack of adequate skills, and you know, um, you know, tech innovation, and many of these issues were there, you know, before the pandemic, and you know, still likely to be there post pandemic. And we've been talking about a lot of these issues for so many years, and um, it, it's going to take a lot, you know, for things to change, as we all know. But OB, um, my question for you is. Um, how do African entrepreneurs thrive in the new tech advanced digitized world, given all the challenges that we face here? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, it's funny, I, I mean, as I'm answering the question, I think I'll also lead off from a couple of things that have been by mm -hmm. other speakers. You know, I was listening to um, Dr. Eleni, and as I'm looking at the thing, I'm thinking, I'm sitting here with, everybody's got heavy academic titles, so I'll just stick with Obi. <laughs> I was, listening, I was listening to Doc talk about the ecosystem in Ethiopia, and to be honest, I was very jealous to hear that 70% of students are, are getting a full STEM education, because if we had that in Nigeria, then I think the world couldn't ever catch Nigeria. Um, when, when, you, when I think about the opportunities, and, and just to go out to your question, I mean, in 2019 as well, I think as Nigeria has been evolving, um, we formed something called ISN, which is about 120 hubs now. And this is all private sector and this is all about collaboration and i think the most important thing 
that it really can happen. It's specifically death from the Nigerian perspective. And I'm sure our continents as well, it's Mauritian. Because for a long time, people operate in silos and they don't talk to each other and they're not talking across industries. So just as Doc was talking about the immense opportunities in the creative industries, which are definitely there, those will be enormously enabled by Africans developing and owning digital platforms to support those industries that we create ourselves. And so we have to find ways to work together in a connected fashion. Um, the difficulties are real. I mean, I need to tell you that, you know, connectivity to the internet, power, you know, I'm in Nigeria, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a toss up. So the environment is not helping you. So every Nigerian for me that excels and, and actually does well in spite of the environment. If we ever get a situation where we get the environment right to support our people, then we are totally unstoppable because the capacity is here, the talent is here. And the biggest talent Nigeria has by far is human talent. It's not oil and gas. It's the human talent because it's the ideas of the people here that will actually drive the future of Nigeria and solve the problems that we have. Somebody asked a question about why we haven't seen Africans developing the vaccine. Um, the funny thing is there are a lot of Africans who are actually solving problems and not just passing conspiracy theories. And I think that's what we need to sort of get to. We need to get to problem solvers. This is 2021. We cannot be afraid of the future. We should be owning technology. And we should also understand that we come from a heritage of ancient technology. You, you couldn't have built what was built on the continent in Ethiopia and Egypt, in Nigeria, back in thousands of years ago if we didn't understand and master technology. So I think some of these issues are really, really about self-confidence and self-realization and also understanding that the capacity and the opportunity lies totally in our hands. I think that I wish I was 20 because when you talk about how do you, you know, technology enables so much more and enables opportunities for scale, distribution, retail at levels that we could never have dreamt about when we were teenagers and, you know, young people growing up. So I think technology enables a lot. But you have to reskill and retool your people so that they can work the jobs of the future. That's really, really important. And countries like Nigeria have to really, really look at that. I mean, in my work as I mean, I'm involved with leading the, the creative industry sector for the national, the long term economic planning for the country. And we've said Prof was talking about twenty thirty. I was making a presentation on, on Thursday and we said that that's gonna contribute hundred billion dollars per annum to the Nigerian economy by twenty thirty. Now, that is if the Nigerian government actually gets behind it if they don't we'll still do 50 60 billion dollars because we're still going to be doing stuff regardless of what government does do you understand so the issue is when the governments connect with the people and enable the people then africa really has no problem that's my view hmm. absolutely i mean collaboration uh, private sector support is important but public sector support i mean i would say even more important um and I, i'd like to bring you in here uh, professor, um, we, we've seen governments all over the world, you know, not just normally supporting you know, their local ecosystem, but even in the pandemic, you know, taking action to uh, support local ecosystem, all sorts of schemes in different countries coming out uh, in the pandemic um, uh, to support entrepreneurship and business. We've not seen much of that uh, on the African continent. Um, so I'd like to ask you, what, what would you like to see governments do to support local businesses now uh, and as we start to recover um, from the pandemic and ongoing. Uh, absolutely, no, thank you very much, uh, uh, Didi. If you, if you allow, I'll, I'll get to that point, but I want to make a quick yeah. connection with what Obi said and uh, Dr. Soli also. So no, Obi, you are absolutely right. So we have to bridge uh, the in a publication I did with Brookings on the 4IR and how Africa can capitalize off initial revolution. So we really have to bridge the labor skill mismatch to ensure that the, the African who are trained, the skills they acquire are aligned with the need of the future of work. So that is a really an area of critical uh, importance. And to the point of uh, Dr. Soli, in a, a forthcoming publication not yet released, that I have on healthcare and the fourth industrial revolution. You are absolutely right. So, uh, so the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, and perhaps for the one may not necessarily uh, uh, know what is the fourth industrial revolution, it is different from digitalization. Sometimes people think that digitalization is the fourth industrial revolution. 
The fourth initial version goes beyond digitalization and is character characterized by the firm of uh, technology, uh, 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 the digital uh, sphere and uh, the physical sphere and represented by the emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, drone, big data, the Internet of Things, among other. And in those areas, during the pandemic, even pre-pandemic, but during the pandemic, numerous African uh, entrepreneurs or uh, partners have been uh, involved in providing exceptional outcome. Let me just provide a few questions. Uh, so, for, so for example, uh, using artificial intelligence, uh, Ubenwa in Nigeria detects child bone uh, asphyxiation. Uh, so, so that's one of the illustration. Uh, Care AI, which is a broader partnership, also will be uh, uh, detecting infectious diseases. With drone, everyone knows about Zipline in Rwanda. Although it was a Californian company, was not able to operate in California when created, but was able to you to deliver. Uh, uh, to use drone for delivery services to rural health facilities in terms of big data so we'll have a vintage we'll use analytic system uh, for health program uh, implementation in terms of the internet of things we'll have the cardio pad in room for example which uh, will accelerate diagnostics especially in terms of a heart scanning uh, device connecting rural patients data with urban cardiologists uh, for evaluation in terms of 3D printing, you have illustrations. I can name hundreds of innovations which are aligned with the fourth industrial revolution despite the challenges, despite the lack of resources. And I think that is uh, definitively uh, an area where uh, the continent is very fortunate to seize the opportunity without necessarily paying the cost. But the challenge is to scale, to scale up those innovations. And that is where GD government intervention is extremely important the ease of doing business it takes for example say about three uh, 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 steps to export in uh, from france or import where it takes over uh, uh, 10 or 11 or one uh, in many of the uh, sub-saharan african countries so reducing the barrier of doing business improving the regulatory uh, environment creating also a conducive environment to attract investors to bridge the infrastructure gap, the physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure, the, the, the government has, really has to be involved. We also have the, the question of education and of human capital, how universities and schools, including at the primary, secondary levels, uh, could really be, uh, uh, curricula could really be reformed in order to provide the entrepreneurial skills to, to, uh, to young uh, kids, the, the science, uh, uh, and other critical uh, 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 skills so that we are really training the leaders uh, uh, of the future. You have the broader competitiveness, how government can really unlock any of the areas where you have, uh, uh, which reduce the competitiveness uh, of uh, firms. Uh, so uh, you also have the investment in research extremely important you cannot be a leader of the fourth initial revolution if you are not doing research if you're not doing development whether it is adaptation identifying what exists in other places and then recreating them or adjusting them to the local contact or it is just firm uh, uh, incredible innovation so those are some of the area in addition of fighting corruption uh, on stack uh, on also reducing uh, currency uh, risk uh, uh, amount of so thank you very much, Edie. All right, you've made some really important points there. And I, I, I know um, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts as well, um, Dr. Solly. I mean, obviously, you know, Professor was talking about um, how just how important it, it is to scale up these innovations. So, yeah, we do have the innovations, but how, how, how do we move forward? Um, and yes, you know, the ease of doing business is, is important. And when it comes to trade, I guess, you know, we are taking, you know, the right steps with the uh, African continental free trade area, even though that will take its time, um, you know, to set in, you know. Um, so let me use uh, Dr. Solly, you know, when you look at, um, you know, the public sector support and uh, what the government should be doing for uh, African entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, uh, that, that's, um, yeah, yeah, a, a, a pretty complex uh, question to uh, to, to ask. But maybe uh, before I, 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 I you know, 
try and intervene in some way. I, I also want to, you know, comment on one thing uh, that you just made uh, just now. Uh, I, I do feel excited actually by, uh, and I think th this is what we should applaud the, the African governments for, for doing. Um, with all the challenges that it has ahead of, uh, you know, uh, you know of, of its implementation, et cetera, uh, the, this African Continental Free Trade Area initiative is something that is to be applauded, uh, in my opinion, nevertheless, because really uh, we are trying now to uh, at least establish a concept of having the largest trade block uh, that uh, has been created since the World Trade Organization. Uh, and, you know, we've got 1.3 billion, 3.3, you know, potentially people say it could be a 3.4 trillion economic block. Of course, there are many, many, many challenges that need to be overcome, like Professor uh, Senior, uh, you know, alluded to in terms of these uh, barriers, uh, inter, you know, country barriers, et cetera. But nevertheless, I think conceptually, this is a great step forward. And what it means is that it will give Africa, you know, the potential to reinforce its negotiating position in the, in, in, in the internal, you know, stage. And, and eventually, if this were to, if we were to get it right, it would lift the region in the priority list of some of those multinational companies. So we might hopefully it could persuade them to really commit resources, for example, to come and manufacture uh, better adapted solutions and closer to them, to its markets and, and clients, uh, so to speak. So. I think that that's to me is something uh, noteworthy. Now, um, with regards to the uh, you know scaling up of uh, you know uh, how do we you know get to scale up things uh, uh, innovations that may be coming through, I, I think there is another fundamental, especially for me, coming from a, a, an academic institution where we train engineers uh, for the future. I think the way you train people, the way you conceive of these con you know, uh, innovations has a big bearing in terms of how easily they will be implemented or industrialized and, 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 uh, and uh, consequently uh, scaled up. Uh, and what I mean is that some, because some people develop things at university that are ill-adapted. Eventually, they find out when they are trying to you know, uh, uh, implement them that, in fact, they, you know, if we, we needed to have thought of this, if we had thought of that, it would work. And then that whole thing delays and it, it, has, it, it incurs other costs. And uh, for example, RCT, uh, the central tech here, we, uh, uh, you know, we've come up with, uh, with a new philosophy on how, you know, how to carry out an innovation uh, program and which is predicated basically on three pillars, what we call cooperation, um, interdisciplinarity and entrepreneurship. So what we mean by uh, the cooperation pillar emphasizes uh, the need to go and identify and, and, and engage uh, with the relevant and appropriate stakeholders in the targeting, even before you start to do research. And from this, you, you know, this helps you to actually frame the question properly, and then you know, uh, start to design a solution that will fit uh, uh, you know, uh, potentially where, you, where it's intended to. And then the, the, the interdisciplinarity part, it, you know, it's, it simply recognizes the fact that if you're trying to develop a, a really effective solution for that type of for, for this type of, of context, uh, it is impossible to be able to do these things in silos. You need interdisciplinarity. Not only do you need multidisciplines academically, but you also need to reach outside, you know, to some of those stakeholders you will, will have already identified to make sure that what you are doing uh, uh, is indeed aligned to what you in, intend to. Uh, um, you know, uh, to, to, to solve, in fact. And then uh, the third pillar, which uh, happens outside of academia, is that of entrepreneurship. Uh, for, for, from our perspective, uh, to date, uh, at least for technology-based uh, uh, solutions, uh, the most effective and uh, successful uh, uh, mechanism for scaling uh, in a cost-effective way uh, and as speedily as possible, uh, you know, this type of innovations is entrepreneurship. Uh, it, it's the creation of, of or is the use of uh, market or commercially based uh, solutions. So uh, what that means for us is that even during the second phase uh, uh, of developing the solutions at university, we start to co-develop and think about the type of business model and business plans can go with this innovation even before it leaves university. So I think changing that mindset, uh, whereas today uh, uh, most academic uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, engineers or are, are trained, they, they, they basically rely on publications and then they, this will be, you know, uh, 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 you know, this will be worked out later. 
So to me, I think the way we also uh, uh, train, uh, 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 you know, the innovators, the engineers that will produce this uh, will have a big bearing in how it is to scale these and how well they will fit and be effective for, for what they are intended for. All right. Amazing. I, I'd, I'd like to bring in um, Dr. Eleni at this point because you know, there are some very key points that are made there, and you know, you stress the importance of training. And I know Obi also uh, mentioned that you know the labor skill mis mismatch, and uh, we also talked about you know reskilling and retooling our people to thrive in this uh, digitized world. Um, Dr. Eleni, perhaps you could speak from your experience with the uh, Blue Moon and the work that you do with. Uh, startups. How how do you start to tackle this when it comes to you know, this area of um, um, this skill mismatch? Okay, um, thank you, Didi. I um, unfortunately I'm going to leave in about two minutes, so I will uh, make this my closing remark as well. Um, I okay. think getting back to concept. Can you hear me? I was told it wasn't very uh, audible earlier. Are you hearing me well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that it really, we need to get back to this concept that we are building innovation ecosystems. We're not an incubator or a university or a venture capitalist. But it, it's all symbiotic. And, um, you know, one of my favorite countries uh, looking at their experience is Israel. Um, and if you look at how intentional the country really put together, you know, what they now call the startup nation, the highest number of startups uh, per capita. Uh, more countries list, um, you know, more companies listed on on Nasdaq or they're doing IPO Nasdaq than all of Europe combined. Um, and and so why is that? It's because they brought together um, university R and D. Some of the things that uh, Soli was talking about, you know, universities that are working with students on projects. Um, but that ha can't work on its own. It has to be linked to corporate R and D. Um, so linking, you know, the corporate sort of commercial uh, arm of that innovation is, is a very key part of it. But then also is the um, incentivizing and kickstarting venture capital and risk capital. Even before you get to um, you know institutional uh, capital, you need um, the risk takers like angel investors. How do you incentivize investment? Um, you know, people that have skills, but also um, you know, some the, the, the first sort of kickoff funds and to start off that journey and, and to, you know, create uh, tax incentives and policy incentives around angel investing, risk investing. Um, and then there's also um, the government side. And I think everybody's talked about it, but I, I want to think about it um, also just sort of adding on to what others have said is that um, we need to create the concept of a regulatory sandbox. In Ethiopia, as soon as you register a company, you know, the tax people start coming after you and every month you're going to spend three days standing in line to declare what your taxes are and you haven't even done anything yet, you know. And so all of this onerous burden of regulation and compliance and all of that, Israel just did it with that and said, you know, when you get registered at the Innovation Authority, which is the local agency, with your startup idea, you kind of all of that policy four to five years in which time you are experimenting and if you fail then that's fine but you know you you don't you're not dealing with this huge burden that kills um data protection it's ip protection um it's incentives you know for investors to, to take that kind of early stage risk um so there's all of that around government um the other part is, and I, and I know others have said it, but um, cheap internet. Um, you know, uh, internet is like the water and, uh, you know, capital is like the air or the other way around. You know, I don't know which one uh, comes first, but you need both um, in, in, in this, in this uh, digital age. It's far from providing that um, the way we need to be doing. Um, the other part is something that I've seen now with my companies uh, in our incubator, which is that um, even if you have a fantastic idea and there's you know capital that might be available, even if you know government policies seem to be okay, which none of which all of these are even existing, but let's say they were, you still have a basic infrastructure problem. How do you get started with a you know 
a, a manufacturing idea if you're standing in line to get land and then you, you you find a place to set up your workshop and then you have to pull electricity to it and water in ethiopia we i don't know as much about other countries but we have industrial parks where we make it very easy for h m or pvch or you know big companies to come and plug and play but we make it very difficult if not nearly impossible for a small you know to get started um, in this seamless way that we do in, in the industrial zones. So, um, you know, so the same way that we have working spaces, we also need to think about plug and play for manufacturing to make it easy to get started. Um, and so these are all of the things that I think, um, uh, you know, uh, we need to think about as we think about our ecosystem. And that, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. I'm going to jump off into another uh, conference. So I need to um, say thank you. So Dr. Lady Gabriel Madin, thank you so much for joining us, or for sharing your views. Uh, it's 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 been great to have you, and thanks so much. Thank you. Also, from my side, um, thanks a lot for coming in. Um, I just want to come on to include some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Um, so, just to pick up on the questions that were asked in our Q and A session, the first question that was asked was directly asked to um, Obi. So, Dr. Edun is asking, looking beyond COVID. When and how do we begin to incorporate indigenous practices like the Igbo apprentice, apprenticeship system into formal education in Nigeria and indeed the continent to help build entrepreneurship on the continent? I, and I guess this expands beyond the traditional apprenticeship, apprenticeship system in Nigeria, but can also be applied. Um, this question can be applied to also various different other contexts. Um, it's a question I'm just going to put out three questions so that um, you guys can feel free to address whichever question um, that you feel most comfortable answering. Um, a second question that we received was, how do we um, make sure that we sustain and maintain innovations that are coming up from Africa? Um, so this question was asked by Elster um, and someone else also built on that question and was um, referring specifically to, for example, drone delivery systems for the vaccine during the COVID pandemic and how we can ensure that such intellectual property returns to African entrepreneurs. So that is one question. And the last question I would pose to the room um, is um, the relationship with, which taught the relationship between the public and private sector, uh, which is how do we um, make sure that the ease of doing business enough in Af how can entrepreneurs basically um, yeah, go beyond, um, uh, manage the changes of regulatory barriers for the private sector. Um, so how can that work? Um, which is, was also a question that our audience asked. So I will leave it at that um, and I will come back in uh, once we close in around 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, can I go, can I go first on the, um, yeah. So, so that, yeah, that was a, I mean, the, the, the question he's asking is a question that uh, maybe some of us have been sitting trying to solve that specific problem or actually engaged in trying to bring it to the table. And I think it's about, it's also a problem that I think has afflicted Africans where we don't have a sense of self value and sense of self. So therefore we tend to discard what is within us because we think it has no value. Whereas the Igbo apprenticeship system has enormous value and has produced significant wealth and there are so many industrialists in my country who have grown from literally nothing to become significant industrialists this man traders real estate people automobile manufacturers and the rest of it so i 100 percent agree um the funny thing about it is one of the reasons i came on the panel was to be able to meet prof and doc <laughs> who, who to my mind in the spaces where we need to actually and that's the collaboration we need to talk about we need to take these indigenous practices, bring them out, stress test them, and then remodel them as platforms for the digital age. And then take the learnings from them and create short courses that can be able to teach people because, you know, you can teach, look, India has educated almost, I don't know, 200 million people, right? In my country, we have two to three million people a year that cannot go to university, but want to go to university. We have to engage digital learning platforms. You know, so the, the bottom line is, you, we really have no choice, whether it's in Nigeria or in any other country in the world. We can't stay stuck in the past. So for me, the indigenous knowledge, 
has to be brought forward to 2021 and pushed 2020, which means why can't we apply AI to Afrobeat dancing? When I see kids dancing on TikTok and doing viral streams, I'm thinking we should be earning from our IP because actually that is original and that's us, right? And this is what is happening on every single social media platform. It is the black kids and the African kids that are always coming with the new iterations, but we haven't yet. Maybe it's the NFTs that are coming and gonna help be able to monetize that stuff. But the reality of it is the natural capacity of the African and the black person to innovate is inbuilt. It's never, it's always been there and it's what we do. And sometimes we didn't even call it innovation, we call it the remix, we remix everything. And the question now for us going forward is how can we collaborate with the technologists, the academics, the triple helix, and the capital to bring these things to our own benefit so that we can own the platforms. So the next conference LSE has is on a platform owned by Africans. I guess that also taps into um, you know, uh, another question that actually came in, in in regards to you know how how we should actually capture you know human capital um, in Africa because um, as you're saying you know this is something that you know these are things that are we should be able to develop some of these things ourselves you know we we shouldn't be looking to outsource um, um, you know a lot of things but as as it stands because of the um, you know the lack of adequate skills. Um, you know, we tend to lean to outsource, you know, people to, to uh, take on some of these tech jobs, um, you know, that are serving other, other, you know, other markets. So uh, I, I don't know if we can bring you in, a, a professor, as well, or is, is there another question that you've written down that you want to answer? Uh, absolutely. Thank you. No, a wonderful point made, uh, Didi and Obi. So, so, so I totally agree uh, what you pointed out. And uh, there are, I have a couple of things that I want to highlight here. So the first one, and I think it's related to how to sustain innovation in Africa and how to gain intellectual property. So there is what uh, we call agile regulation or agile governance. African government should really uh, be more involved in agile regulation, agile governance, and multi-stakeholder collaboration. This a uh, the important challenge uh, faced uh, in the context of the fourth uh, industrial revolution. We have the pacing problem on the continent, but also around the world. In innovators are going uh, developing new ideas, product project, projects at an incredible speed, much faster than government are used uh, 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 to regulate uh, uh, the regulation process. But on the other hand, we have government which are which are often slow. We have some exception, of course, but which are often slow at reacting, at creating the space to test those innovation, uh, at creating regulatory sandboxes, uh, at experimenting uh, some of those uh, innovation. And even when that happens, sometimes there's another factor. We also have the citizens or the clans where we, which are who are not always involved in the process to make sure that ultimately they are better served uh, as well. So the goal if, of agile governance is to solve that pacing problem, the speed, the appropriate speed, but also the coordination problem, how to engage with a broad variety of actors to ensure that output uh, will ultimately continue to encourage innovation while uh, the, the actions taken by government will uh, also, both enable the innovations, but uh, uh, contribute to better serve uh, citizens uh, and um, to better serve citizens and clans. So, if I uh, the second point that I want to make here is related to women. Women. So we have discussed extensively, but not enough, I think, about the incredible barrier face. Uh, by women when it comes to entrepreneurship, when it comes to uh, ownership. And really, government have to remove those legal constraints to gender equality and regulatory implementation gap 
uh, but also strengthen land tenure because when we speak about land tenure, also speak about the ability to have more investment. Expanding women linkage and linkages and network is really important uh, 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 for women to connect with uh, ecosystem or uh, among others. Uh, 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 critical uh, for success is not just good, but it is all. It's not just the right thing to do, but it's also the most effective uh, thing to do. And providing, of course, facility for access to financial resources. And let me tell you why this is incredibly important. Some recent studies uh, have shown that by achieving gender equality, uh, the uh, gross domestic products on some African countries can, so, so the performance in terms of African economies could uh, raise from one to 50% for some countries. 50 is the highest and one is one of the lowest. So, so I just want to say it is not just the right thing to do, but it is also economically uh, 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 productive uh, to fully include women in the entrepreneurial and economic uh, activities and spheres uh, among other. So we need more women in position of leadership, but not just leadership, power, economic power, e economically empowered women. Uh, also, if you see many of the innovations around the fourth industrial revolution are driven by women uh, uh, on the continent. Absolutely, a very important point there. You're in couple barriers that are faced by women. Um, Dr. Solly, I don't, I don't know if we can bring you in here. Uh, perhaps there's a question that was asked that uh, you would like to answer, um, that, you know, yes. based on what our host mentioned, or would you like to tap into one of the comments made by either uh, Professor or Obi? Yeah, uh, uh, a bit of both. Mm -hmm. I very much uh, liked uh, the, 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 you know, the, the comments from Obi about indigenous knowledge. Uh, in fact, uh, in South Africa, we faced uh, we face a similar problem uh, for uh, with regards to indigenous knowledge from traditional healers. Um, South Africa has uh, is, is is known to be very rich in, in biodiversity, and as a, res as a result, some of the, its uh, uh, previous inhabitants have figured out ways to use some of plants that they found that can actually have uh, highly beneficial uh, health uh, uh, you know outcomes. And so the government has had a big challenge trying to really see how can they bring that knowledge to try to mainstream, uh, you know, uh, uh, to mainstream economic benefits. So I think these are, uh, uh, you know, this is an, uh, 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 a very, very interesting, uh, you know, uh, a development from another point of view for that, that is seen there in, in Nigeria. Now, with regards to one of the questions uh, um, that was posed, there was one uh, that related to how can uh, uh, African IP be kept in, in, in Africa? And that is a, you know, that is a, a, a fairly, uh, you know, a, a serious question. And, um, you know, we've been looking at it, uh, uh, you know, here at uh, the Essential Tap, we've actually been, uh, you know, thinking a lot about this. Uh, Typically what happens if you look at the innovation process is that people, you know, science engineers, et cetera, figure out uh, something interesting, uh, uh, you know, within, if you look at technology base, especially, uh, you know, they figure out and demonstrate the feasibility of a potential, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, technology and how it can solve them. And then from this, you can derive intellectual property. But then there's usually a big step in terms of uh, uh, creating what is called a, a prototype to an industrialized, uh, uh, industrializable, uh, 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 you know, pro a product that needs manufacturing. And unfortunately, most of that is lacking in Africa. And that, that comes back to, you know, and uh, what usually happens is that because it's lacking, either this goes uh, down the drain or it has to be taken out and be prototyped elsewhere and in the end uh, because of uh, you know a uh, lack of control of events outside of that that ip may end up being lost with it then which means now it comes back to need to uh, actually strengthen uh, you know the e ecosystems uh, uh, not only just making sure that the entrepreneurs are able to come out of university create their business you know their businesses but from a, 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 a there is also a need for an infrastructure that allows them to bring that to a final product because that is where a lot of technology-based uh, uh, innovations 
uh, and IP gets lost on the continent uh, across the board. And we are trying to uh, set up a similar a project of that kind that can intervene in this space in, in, in terms of, for example, here at the Central Tab. Mm -hmm. Now, um, David, I wonder if you'd like us to to continue. I know that you know we've gone over the designated yes. timing, uh, even though um, on the clock it still says we have four minutes because we started late. Yes, we did start late, so I would possibly use those four minutes for closing remarks because we do have to move on to our next session in four minutes. So please keep those closing remarks uh, short. But your input has been so great and so appreciated so far. So I will wrap yeah. up after the closing remarks. Awesome. Sure, sure. Um, I, I think that, you know, there's one particular question, you know, that came in from uh, LSE, you know, um, the organizers, which I, I think is really a good way to, you know, to end things. And I'd like you to answer this very quickly, one minute, you know, when you look at the landscape of entrepreneurship in Africa, uh, what excites you the most and what gives you less nights? Uh, Professor first. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So what excites me the most is clearly what I mentioned in the, uh, at the beginning. So uh, the tremendous potential of Africa uh, and the incredible uh, entrepreneurial culture uh, and dynamism. I think that is the element which is the most exciting one. And uh, the, the element which concerns uh, I think a couple of elements. So we have the uh, uh, the gap between the perception that Africans have about the ability that they have to run businesses and the actual uh, sales uh, level. And the second one is the business environment. Doing business in Africa, engaging, negotiating on the continent is incredibly complex. So government have to do better um, in terms uh, of uh, un in terms of unlocking, improving the business environment, access to finance, uh, amount order. So thank you. Dr. Solly? Well, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, Prof. Andrea summarized it very well. I mean, uh, I share the same sentiment in terms of the vibrancy of, of, of African entrepreneurs when you see them. Even I met a 14-year-old once in Tanzania who gave me a, a, a unbelievable spiel about uh, why, how he was going to apply drones for agriculture, etc. But the barriers they face, it's tough enough being an entrepreneur, even in, 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 in a high income, you know, in, in the you know, industrialized world. The barriers, the, the additional barriers that, you know, that they face uh, are, are, are really, really daunting. I, I mean, this is what, like I say, is worrisome and we need um, access to resources. Uh, and resources come in the way of, uh, you know, like uh, finance and maybe mentoring as well. How do you mentor these young guys to actually do things uh, the way they should be? Because starting a startup company is a specialized skill and you cannot teach that at university. You need really strong mentors from, you know, so creating those support networks and, and all the other things that I've, I've talked about, uh, right. uh, also just hard things on the ground and training, et cetera. So those are the, the, the type of barriers that we need to really find ways to join hands, you know, uh, in our, uh, on, on a pan-African scale to try and, 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 and figure out solutions going forward. Okay, and Obi, let's have you in quickly. Yeah, thanks a lot. First of all, it's been great to be here and have this conversation. Um, for the, the big stuff, the big things that have happened, I mean, you know, we picked up, I, one of my key, key industries is the Nigerian music industry. We just picked up a couple of Grammys. So that's huge for us. You know, we're pushing the culture global. Um, I'm also very excited about what's happening with FinTech in Nigeria for more things to come out of that space. The difficulties are, are every day for every single one of us. Anybody who operates on the continent knows how real it is and how real it gets. And in Nigeria, all we try to do is just keep going in spite of everything. And I think that's really the attitude of the Nigerian entrepreneur, and that's the best attitude every entrepreneur should have. Keep going. Absolutely. I, I, I think that's a very good place to leave it. Thank you. Um, thank you all for that. And uh, there you have it, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all our viewers. On behalf of the LSE Africa Summit, I'd like to thank our panelists, Professor Landry Sine, Dr. Soli Makuliso, OBS Sika, and Dr. Lenny Gabriel Madden. Thank you for sharing your views and for your guidance uh, this afternoon. And thank you to all our viewers uh, for your chatting, your questions, and for making this as interactive as possible. Thanks for being in today, and have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you so you. much.
Thanks so much, Elsie, for my side. I just want to make a quick announcement. So this is the next session that's going to happen now, uh, which is Out of the Revolution. So um, please feel free to head over to Out of the Revolution, which is going to be our exhibition. And after that, we also still have a book launch um, and some exciting sessions at the end of the day. Thanks for my side. Um, and I think everything has been said that needs to be said. Um, and I hope to see you in the next session. Thanks a lot. Thank you.